Their sacred empiricism has no meaning when it can be bought. When they can't even see that this man is colored because he says he is not, or doesn't even say it. They see his skin and see a white man. Retreat behind the stone walls of the Institute does not change matters. He is still not colored. There is another world beyond this one. He was trying to tell them, and they wouldn't hear it. Don't believe your eyes. Yeah, okay, so uh, do you know what this is? Let's see if it's in the camera. That is a brick tune. <laughs> what, is is, a, in, what is a brick tune? <laughs> it is, in fact, a brick tune, which is... I used to have the, the exact same version of this under another brand. This is things get manufactured in China, and then other people, maybe in China, then stick random brand names on them for the same thing. But it is a, a very reasonably upper middle brow, reasonably priced Bluetooth speaker. That was my prominent Bluetooth speaker. And because I drive a truck from 1999, it was the primary way that I've been listening to podcasts and mm -hmm. books in my car. But it's a little too quiet. So I recently upgraded to one with a little more wattage. And I am seeking to shed uh, as much stuff as I can from my truck and camper living on the road. Mm -hmm. um, and I also felt like this would be a good opportunity for a listener contest in drawing and giveaway, our first ever listener giveaway. So if Chris Bag improves, this is the first time you're hearing of it. My uh, proposal is that anybody will be entered into a drawing to read my, I'm not going to say used, I'm going to say storied um, uh, Bluetooth, where I have listened, you know, to many legendary podcasts over the years. It's still got lots of life. Uh, it is suitable, oh, for use in a car. And I should tell you what inspired this particular giveaway, too, which is I was visiting, um, well, I shouldn't be too specific, but I happen to know that a certain recent guest on Upper Middle Brow, whose name rhymes with Madam Croc has not yet listened to his episode uh, in which he is the guest, even though it came out many, many weeks ago, because he hates us and hates me. Um, and I, that, That's a bummer. I, I'm, it I'm is sad, a bummer. I'm sad to hear that that has happened in that time between our episode, that he decided to hate us and hate you. Yeah, well, this I shouldn't have given away the gender, but this person doesn't actually hate us. Um, the real issue here is that he's a dad and he's a busy teacher and he doesn't actually have a way to listen to podcasts in, in the car, which is where he would sometimes have free time for things hmm. like that. Um, and so I thought, oh, maybe there would be hundreds of more upper middle brow listeners out there or thousands if only they had a device to listen. So we can remedy this one listener at a time. Um, you know, I, I have, hang on. Uh-oh, we're gonna up the ante. I sense the ante is about to be upped. Bag has disappeared into the blur, the zoom blur that is obscuring dungeon bag from my vision, from my scrying. He has returned. I can sweeten the pot. Oh my goodness. <laughs> what are you holding in your This right is hand? a magic box too. Ooh. Yeah. Is it also a Bluetooth uh it is play? also a Bluetooth uh speaker um that also has maybe seen slightly better days, but I will also say storied. Um mm -hmm. and uh recently my larger uh more powerful Bluetooth speaker um, was on a bit of a voyage, um, uh -huh. a, a bit of a sabbatical from my house, and mm. uh, it has since returned. But uh, this was, uh, I went and grabbed my, my backup. Um, and I think I might even have another one because it was given out as a, like, thank you gift by the mortgage company Yeah, for the house. And I was like, really? <laughs> okay. I mean. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, because the mortgage wants you to listen to mortgage company wants you to listening to their like on banking podcast. I guess you know. something like that. It seemed a little random, um, but I don't quite know where that that one is more. That one's more sort of giveaway level. This one's like pretty nice. But Just imagining uh, 
Yeah. Oh, sorry to interrupt. I'm just imagining on banking with like Tim and Chad. Dave. You know, or yeah, Tim and Tim, Tim and Chad. Chad. Like for sure. Hey, welcome to on banking this week with Tim and Chad. Yeah, we get some really exciting new mortgage rates and new mortgage products to talk about this rate. Uh, but at first, you know, we're going to do the close of the week. Dave is here with the cl- <laughs> just. I once uh, uh once I was mistakenly sent. Uh, an email from the mortgage company. Uh, I was sort of CC'd on an email that was intended to be an internal email only. Um, oh, it was marvelous. Uh, it had the word whales in all capitals deployed like several times throughout the, the email. Um, and it was like a little trip through like, it was like a, it was like, like a, a little mini version of the intuitionist, or like a, a like a very land. suburban Glengarry Glen Ross. Yeah, like, <laughs> just just awful. Like you know, like if you came in second, you would get a Bluetooth speaker, and if you came in third, you would get a stern talking to from your boss, <laughs> and like and like maybe you wouldn't be invited to that week's trip to Burgerville. Um, but uh, soy milk is for closers. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow. Oh, it was that sounds great. Like fun. I feel like, I feel like you need to mine a poem or a short story out of that. Uh, yeah, I bet I've still got the email. I, yeah. I should, uh, I'll just, I'll just, yeah, I'll go digging for that. Um, it could be very funny. Um, it opens gentlemen. I enjoyed our call on Tuesday. It's always refreshing to hear what's working for others across the country. Keep up the mm. prospecting. Paragraph mm. break. The next three words are in all capitals. Whales, whales, whales. That's the goal for these next few weeks. The more all caps leads you have, the more loans you'll close. Whales, leads, leads, apps, apps, fundings. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we should do like an upper middle brow, like Harper's annotation of this email. Yeah, it's amazing. Always be wailing. Always be wailing. Uh, yes. Yeah. It, uh, All right, Ahabs. All right, Ishmaels. All right, Queek Eggs. Let's sharpen those harpoons. The, the very literary mortgage guy. <laughs> and even better, like imagining this guy as like a really like cut rate Captain Ahab. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, well, yeah. this bit is working. Nice job. We're calling first place Tash Tigo. Second, <laughs> I can't remember the name of the third harpoonist. The Tash Tigo Quiqueg, and there's one more, but um, all of what? whom are sort of exoticized, you know, non white people, um, yes. noble savages, uh, uh, orientalized, slash, indigenized. Which um, is um, not a bad place to jump off to where we're talking about today well i I gotta we gotta do our giveaway man i know know. (laughs) well well Well, so what's the yeah what's the uh so here's here's what you have to do to be entered and here wait what's the (laughs) what's the score johnny okay so it's really simple listeners all you got to do is prove that you told somebody else about upper middle brow and that they gave it a try which is actually not that simple, um, but we will accept an affidavit. Uh, we will accept a screen cap of a texting exchange. We'll accept a video you, of you in the car with a friend saying, hey, I'm going to play you this podcast, Upper Middle Brow, while your friend puts their fingers in their ear. Any of those, you guys are creative. You're Upper Middle Brow listeners. You can come up with something. Um, yeah, an affidavit, some evidence And what I'm thinking is that we need a minimum of five for the giveaway. Uh, Our audience isn't huge, but I feel like five people can tell five other people about Upper Middle Brow. So maybe the first five get entered into a drawing for the Brick Tune, and then the next five plus the four losers Mm, from the first also get entered into a drawing for what is it called? The Magic Box? The 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 Magic Box 2 for the magic box too so that's two giveaways and at the end of it we have the potential to have 10 more upper middle brow listeners and two listeners may be able to listen more frequently because you'll have a storied uh and you know our listeners like stories you'll have a storied uh bluetooth audio speaker 
be very good if you had, you know, like a 13 year old daughter or something like that, mm. and, you know, and you wanted a, a kind of beater gift. Um, so, yeah, that's our giveaway. And Chris Bag snuck in a digression about whales and whales. mortgages into the middle of it, and we did a Moby Dick illusion. So that was a pretty darn upper middle brow opening bit right there. Yeah, I'd say we're warmed up. I mean, our, our rambles also kind of function as our improv warm ups, really. Yeah. Uh, it's an exercise in kind of just going with wherever we're at. Everybody get up and walk around. Yeah, why don't we just, you want to just get recapping? Um, yeah. I, I think, yeah. Let's get into it. It's a little bit tricky. Um, I finished today as well. And I and it was tricky because I got a little bit confused about what happened at the very end. Me too. Um, but I think probably the second half starts with the conclusion of Lila May's date, um, in which she sort of wished more would happen, but it did not. And this is a flashback date. This is Lila May at probably age seventeen or something like that, or eighteen back home. Yeah. Um, and then that takes us pretty quickly. There is another scene with uh, Natchez, and that scene in which is revealed by Natchez, he claims to be James Fulton's nephew, um, which means, since Natchez is black, that James Fulton is black. And then we have a series of flashbacks that seem to, in fact, demonstrate that James Fulton was a always rather light-skinned black person growing up and even as a teenager would sometimes be mistaken for white um, in his local community um, who then, you know, was was very uh, talented and intelligent and headed off to school to, and at some point started passing as white, which was quite easy for him to do. And so all this time, you know, Lila May's uh, intellectual hero and the sub- purported inventor of the perfect elevator of the black box of the future of vertical transport is, you know, perhaps not surprising. Um, and the, the leader and the intellectual um, inspiration for the intuitionists is apparently secretly or was a black man. And um, maybe you can take us to the funicular follies. For sure. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the the farther I got into this book, the more I realized this was a noir story that is getting played with. The conventions are getting played with. Sure. And um, so for most noir stories, films, books, there is a MacGuffin. Uh, the MacGuffin in this case is the blueprint of the of Fulton's black box elevator. We've got some notes. We've got some journals. Uh, we pretty much have everything except the blueprints, which is what everybody's trying to get after. Um, and all of our plot characters, Kanker, the head of the empiricists, um, Lever, uh, the head of the intuitionists, um, are all trying to track down uh, these blueprints. And um, the Funicular Follies is a yearly um, extravaganza that is mostly attended by empiricists, as far as I can tell, mostly because intu- intuitionists just seem to be a little more rare. Um, and it is a fairly run of the mill, mid century kind of dudes party. There are cheesecake girls. There is a really not so good scene of black minstrels, minstrelsy, um, blackface um, that happens. Uh, there's a lot of uh, there's cigar smoking. Um, it's it's generally um, white dudes behaving badly, uh, is what I would call that scene. White white dudes behaving badly in for the sake of a, of corporate esprit de corps. Exactly. Perfect. Or in this case, bureaucratic esprit de corps. <laughs> Words that aren't usually mentioned together, but I love it. Mm. Um, this party is uh, marred, and and I should say, Lila Mae Watson um, pretends to be a server. Um, uh, tends to be one of the help. Um, another another very clever setup on on Whitehead's part to put his black heroine. Uh, to insert her as part of the help, knowing that she will, of course, be invisible. 
Um, there's lots of echoes of Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man here. Um, that one particularly overt and particularly smart, I think. Um, nobody knows that she's there except for the head of internal affairs, um, Mr. I think Arbogast. Ar yeah. <laughs> wonderful. Like yeah. a little confusing. All the, all the names I know, are, are top, wonderful. Top notch. Yeah. A little confusing because it's so close to the name of the of the um elevator manufacturer, um Arbo. Mm. Um and maybe it's Abergast, maybe that's more correct, but in any case it's close enough to be confusing. Yeah. So Lila May gets to witness uh, Kanker tries to reenact Otis's safety elevator moment uh, okay. from the 1850s. And in a moment of sabotage uh, that some people think is revenge for the elevator that Lila May is being set up uh, for. But uh, the safety elevator doesn't work. Kanker crashes to the floor and breaks his leg. Um, and, uh, and it's sort of, uh, this is enough fodder to kind of even the race, uh, for the head of the elevator inspection guild between Kanker and his opponent lever. Um, like as I'm doing this recap moment, like I'm also realizing this, this novel really like ascends to the absurd. Like we're really in that area. It does. It does. And it's, it, it's, and you know, it's interesting that you say that it is a noir. It's playing with noir, but I wonder if all the great noirs are always playing with the convention of noir. Like, I wonder, you know, it's the same way that people say that, what was it, like 13 days later or 28 days, th 28 days later was the thinking man's Night of the Living Dead. But then if you go watch the Night of the Living Dead, you're like, oh, the Night of the Living Dead is the thinking man's Night of the Living Dead. You know, it's a great question. Uh, yeah, it's a great yeah. idea. Like, what is like, is there is there a straight noir? Like, yeah. is the question or was it instantly satire? It, it may not always be satire, but I think one of the conventions is always peeling back onions. Yeah. And one of the conventions is always the protagonist's assumptions that are dearly held at some point are proven wrong at least once. Yeah. Uh, and it, we're very much in line with that, with those two. Yeah. This, I was going to talk about this later, but like noir's convention is that the protagonist is always too late. You know, they're 10 minutes behind. They miss the piece of information. They're mistaken. They, you know, they're, they're constantly being put in a place of, yeah, like you said, their assumptions being proved wrong, even as they are failing forward. And then, and then there is a catching up, but but sometimes the catching up is it is enough for the protagonist to learn what is quote really going on, mm -hmm. but maybe not enough to do anything about it. Totally. You know, as in Chinatown, you know, um, cl classic example of that, which in and of itself I think of as a neo noir, um, even though that film is probably now older than the films that it was pastiching. Mm -hmm. But so after that, I feel like we do get a little bit of a kind of there's a little bit of a plot lull in the sense that it's really just people sort of sharing information. Uh, there's a scene with um, what's our, what the, the the nice guy Chuck Chuck, Chuck. Gould. There's some other stuff with Natchez, um, who now Lila May is sort of in a conspiracy with. To, to she she feels like he um, is the true heir to Fulton, and therefore. You know, if she finds the blueprints, she's going to give them to him. And they're doing some espionage. They're sneaking around and following Pompey. Um, but to me, the next really big plot point that... And there, oh, there's a very interesting moment where she confronts Pompey, too, that maybe we'll talk about a little bit later. I, one of my favorite moments in the entire book, I think. To me, the next real plot thing that happens is she sneaks into the Lyft magazine office to try to figure out if there's any information there. And Ben Urich, the reporter, who I think last we saw was being tortured by the mob, mm -hmm. has been let out and sort of surprises her there and lets her in on some important information that the true puppet masters all this time were not, in fact, the mob, who are bit players, and not, in fact, the intuitionist camp and the... Um, uh, uh, what's the other, the, the um, I'm forgetting the other camp's name. Can you remind me? The empiricists. Yeah, the, not the empiricist camp, but in fact, 
the el the competing elevator manufacturers. And in fact, she discovers that Natchez is not who he says he is, and he's somebody who, along with the two Irish thugs from very early on, uh, Jim and John, um, is working for one of the elevator companies. I think it's Arco. Or, uh, is that right? Arbo. Or, or Arbo. Yeah. yeah, he's working for one of the elevator companies. I think it's Arbo. And then they are suddenly, in a very noir-like way, confronted by the two henchmen, and there's a bit of a chase scene, uh, very interesting sort of digression slash escape. One thing, just as an aside... This book is written in a way to me that feels very cinematic. Um, but that's, I guess, maybe I'll leave you to do sort of the final unraveling. So at this point, Lila May basically does a kind of final series of investigations to yep. sort of figure out what is really going on, starting with visiting Mrs. Claire, is that Rogers. her name? Mrs. Mrs. Rogers. Ro Mrs. Yeah. Rogers, one more time. Yeah, Mrs. Rogers' house has also been ransacked in, in a pretty, like, sad way. It, it, like, sort of a last-ditch effort of this kind of corporate thuggery to locate the um, the blueprints and the journals and everything like that. That the you know, real Hail Mary to find the MacGuffin. Um, they aren't successful. And what... Lila May discovers from talking to Mrs. Rogers is that, in fact, this whole intuitionist thing is a bit of a joke uh, mm. that uh, that James Fulton has come up with, mostly due to his frustrations with the world that he is in. And like a lot of jokes that are sometimes posed by very smart and very capable people, sort of like Jonathan Swift or in uh, or you know the other analog I can think of is uh, born in the USA getting picked up and used as Ronald Reagan's uh, campaign sure. music and the joke becomes real and intuitionism becomes real and we sort of begin to and and Fulton kind of descends into more and more eccentricities and notices Lila Mae Watson in a scene that we had seen earlier in the book and puts an observation in his notes that Lila Mae Watson is the one, mm -hmm. um, suggesting that maybe intuitionism isn't a joke because we know that Lila Mae is very good at her job. She has a 100% success rate when she is right. intuiting. And uh, she basically is picking up the work uh, that Fulton left off of trying to strive towards this black box elevator and uh, headed for the second elevation. Right. Uh, right. Again, a very like liturgical um, kind of mirror or parroting of the second coming. Yes. Yes. With elements, I think of Martin Luther King's the mountaintop, you nice. know? Yeah. Um, um, and so she learns this, then she goes to confront Natchez, who we now know uh, has a different name, Combs. And she goes to a very nice, very corporate building where he no longer sounds like a down home uh, black uh, southern guy, but sounds corporate and is clearly making a lot of money. And he kind of confesses all of his machinations to her. They have a kind of classic noir. Might as well tell me everything. It's all over. And, oh, maybe she's going to kill him. Maybe she's got a gun in her parcel. But no, she hands him what appears to be the MacGuffin for reasons that are puzzling to the audience and puzzling to Combs. Uh, but then I think what we learn in the last scene, and it's a little bit confusing, is that she handed him a fake. Mm -hmm. um, and that she has kept some of the materials for herself, which gives us a little bit of a, a little bit of a mysterious ending. Maybe that there, maybe maybe this thing that started as a joke, maybe it that that then seems to will an actual phenomenon into existence, which is intuitionism, as evidenced by Lila May being one of the more successful and accurate elevator inspectors using intuitionism that maybe the spark of intuitionism will kindle mm -hmm. in some way. There's a little bit of hope of that at the very end. And I don't know, there may be a few other plot details I missed. I get the sense that Lila May's sort of potential implication in the falling elevator, the failed elevator, now feels like a red herring now that all is revealed. Nobody seems to be particularly worried about that. Yeah. I think we get the sense that she's going to be fine. 
Um, it's not like she extracted ten thousand dollars in a promise, but there is a sense that sort of like the game is ended. Yeah, and it's you know my my impression of this book as as we rounded it out, it's a little unfocused. Yeah, the language is bananas good. Oh yeah. I, I eventually had to stop, um, you know, book darting sentences because it was just getting my, I think I ran out of book darts and my book was getting very heavy. I, I found myself thinking very much of Zodiac. A clearly talented writer biting off more than he can quite chew. Although yeah. I would say this is a much better book than Zodiac. Yeah. Oh, totally. He, somebody who is not in full realization of his powers, but is already showing tremendous pride. He wrote this, this book came out when he was 30. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think my prescription is that the weight of the allegory became too heavy. Yeah. And that he really had something he wanted to say and the allegory had to fit that to the point where it, it, it starts, you know, it, it starts disrupting sort of the story mm-hmm. and the plot. Like the, the, just the weight of it becomes too heavy. I think it becomes too heavy in terms of the plot. And then I think it becomes too heavy in terms of the mood because I was very entertained by the first half of the book. And I found the second half of the book to be just sad. And I, I found the ending to be almost and maybe it's just the fact that I finished it today and it's a very gloomy day here in Virginia and it's dark and I was a little bit low energy. But I was like, man, this is just a bummer. Yeah. Um, and no, I agree with that. It is a great book. I just I, I suspect that if you were to, you know, keep reading Colson Whitehead into his maturity, you're going to see better matches of ambition. I mean, this is one of the things I mention a lot, which is, is the ambition matched to the execution? Mm-hmm. And the ambition of this novel is actually enormous, and and surprisingly so. Uh, I didn't, when I first started reading it, I actually thought, oh, this is going to be, this is going to be a tot little, yeah. tot little allegory and a tot little neo-noir. Yeah, I you was know, ready for and, a romp. Yeah, uh, it's going to be a romp, and there's going to be some symbolism that's going to make me think, and it's going to be very enjoyable. But I think, you know, it's, it makes total sense. I think he just had more that he had to get off his chest than the book could, could quite contain. Yep. And yet, it's still, I feel enormously enriched by reading it. And, and that sadness, some of it is narrative dissatisfaction, but some of it is actually just the truth that he is exploring is a bummer i think what he's saying is that for in this world that is being described of say the 1950s a liberated racially harmonious world is not available there's a moment where james fulton says something like they'll never these people will never achieve it they don't want to be elevated above their dung heap or something like that you know i could try to find and i think i think I think, you know, at least in the time of period that this book is describing and also in the time period that Colson White had wrote it. And also now there's a lot of truth to that. And yeah. it is just a bummer. But there's also a little bit of optimism in it, too. Right. There is this sense that there is a pure idea at the center of the joke that true believers can kindle as well. Uh, I'm going to go to my first question, unless you have more that you want to say about... No, I just wanted to, to cap off that idea. Like, it's always sad to remember that transcendence is never perfect and always farther out of our reach than we would want it to be. Yeah, and I would say it's also way out of reach yeah. for these characters. Um, it's not It's bare, It's not even really within eyesight, you know, except yeah. for in a maybe intuitive way and i think that um, you're, you're feeling about present day is you know some of the bummer that you're feeling is yeah. that perhaps that transcendence is slipping even farther from from our grasp in our kind of current um socio-political climate um and that's sad i mean the yeah. the 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 hope of the book is that she is continuing and yeah. my god if that if if that if he had not included that i i think i would have like you know, torn out my earbuds and thrown them in the creek. Yeah, you know, she just gets a job as like, um, you know, Combs executive assistant and exactly. her salary yeah. doubles. And yeah, that would have been a terrible ending. Right. And just like succumbs to the corporate greed. In that sense. And, and, and the struggle continues. The thing I think that's depressingly sad is that 
if the allegory is more or less what I think about it, which is not just the uplifting of black people, but a kind of liberated world, the mountaintop, Martin Luther King's mountain cop top, the world, the beloved community where, where everybody has dignity, where everybody has what they need to survive and to thrive, where everybody is beloved, that in America, this is the thing that black people have always been struggling for. And it is the thing that sometimes some white people also join that struggle. But a lot of white people seem to rather be at the top of the dung pile than on the mountaintop. Yeah. You know, that, that, that this is James Fulton's observation. That, you know, they'd rather basically live in hell on earth with a slight advantage over other people than, than aspire to something greater to that. And, you know, maybe that's a little bit too simple. The world is a complicated place, but that does appear to be the case. And it's also, it's sort of like if Colson Whitehead is, is riding with a kind of smothered rage, which is your term from last time, but a kind of, a, but also with a twinkle in his eye. Yeah. The first half, there's a, there's a smothered rage, but a kind of wags delight in pointing out the hypocrisy in, then the tone just becomes increasingly sad. But let me ask you, though, this was the question I wanted to start, to start with, which is, what do you think the function of this kind of... There are at least three characters who weren't who we thought they were mm-hmm. at the beginning of the book. And then maybe that's just the convention of noir, but I think, what do you think that achieves? So we've got Natchez, I know, is one uh, that, you, uh, that you kind of bring up. Um, James Fulton, is that the other? And then who are, who are you also thinking of? I think arguably Pompey proves mm. to be more complicated than yep. he was originally portrayed as, and certainly Lila May's original. Um, so he's one. I also think, you know, Reed, um, in a way, proves to be the pawn of these corporations as opposed to a mastermind himself. I even think Ben Urich, his yep. appearance and his kind of... Res- he was in my mind. He was down for the count. You know, we weren't going to see him again. Yeah. And I even, which even makes me wonder. I assumed that he was the, the screaming, screaming man, man, but right, I don't who, think he was. Now. Maybe that was a bait and switch. I, maybe, maybe we were meant. You know, maybe there was a kind of narrative trick where we were meant to assume that he was the screaming man, but that in fact the screaming man was another person being tortured by the mob who had characteristics similar to Ben Urich, but Ben Urich was merely roughed up a bit. Yeah, I do think it's the nature of noir, and I do think it is a bait and switch, especially with Ben Urich, and also with Natchez. Um, yeah. Another convention of noir is a love interest. Yeah. Like it just happens uh, in every in every noir movie book, even the ones where you think, do, do we really need this? Does Sam Spade really need like a love interest to to make this? But it's part of it's part of the shtick, and it is a thing to remember that a lot of noir is pulpy and is yeah. originally intended as a page turner, um, and uh, and we're working within those conventions here. And I think what Whitehead is doing is playing with those conventions. So I'm going to use them. Um, and I think that Natchez turning from a sort of like country boy co-conspirator like sex pot because he's drawn really warmly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Lila May definitely has some like pretty warm feelings about him. You know, is kind of a- eventually rendered as just sort of a corporate stooge. And I think that this, this, this whole book is, a, is basically one extended narrative sleight of hand, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. That, um, and it kind of goes to my question about Schrodinger's elevator later on. Because the nature of reality is kind of what is being discussed here. And yeah. like what lies beyond this world. And may, can we maybe even transcend this world into a world where elevators float free of their counterweights and their railings and their tracks. You know, I I can't wait to read The Underground Railroad next because I really think that maybe that is a metaphorical vehicle that is better suited to the project. You know, similar, similar ideas, cars, tracks, things like that. But I think that the characters who don't turn out to be who we thought they were at first is part of the convention. 
Um, yeah. But then also is really hinting at what he is trying to get at is that you really, that you can't trust empiricism. Yeah. That you can't, you know, even it, like empiricism is a white man's game. He even talks mm. about that for a while mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. That when you're white, it's much easier to take things at face value um, because you're sort of like, you're kind of given the world and you're given the keys to the world. And so mm. I think that by playing with identity and kind of pulling the rug out from us narratively, he is seating us in the experience of his black protagonist. That, like, you mm. can't be empirical when you are black. Um, that intuition is crucial. And, mm. like, trusting your gut. And, and maybe that being part of the thing that takes us to transcendence. But, yeah, so I think it's part convention. And I think it's part his own playing with that convention in service of his larger rhetorical drive. Your answer wants, wants, makes me want to skip to the reading that I had queued a little bit later. Are you yeah, okay with that? Let's do that. Okay. So, unfortunately, I misplaced my reading glasses, but fortunately, my hosts had some glasses laying around, which I guessed were reading glasses, and they appear to be. So, yeah. So, one of the things that happened, I mentioned this earlier, is that Lila May has suspected that Pompey, who is, was the first black elevator inspector and who she describes as being appallingly obsequious, that he sabotaged the, the elevator at Kanker's request as a way of ingratiating himself and, you know, sort of to stick it to a rival. Um, and so she goes and confronts him. He denies it. And then he gives a kind of elegant defense of his behavior where he has he's sort of a people pleaser with regard to the white people. She actually thinks of him as a quote unquote Uncle Tom. And he defends himself and basically says, Look, it's their world. I did what I needed to do for my family. And not only that, if I hadn't absorbed all the abuse I did as the first black man in this department, you would have a much harder time. And which could very well be true. You know, there's something to that. And so Lila May decides that she um, believes Pompey that he didn't do it and that her own prejudices and her own propensity to be in conflict uh, with somebody she thinks of as a kind of obsequious Uncle Tom or house slave or whatever term you want to use for that sort of tricked her into believing something that wasn't true. So she's now having this conversation with Mrs. Rogers and Mrs. Rogers is explaining how all of these white elevator inspectors did not understand James Fulton's joke. And she's talking about how they have their rules and their regulations and their empiricism. And Lila May responds to this and says, they looked at the skin of things, Lila May offers. They couldn't see his lie. It was Pompey that allowed her to see Fulton's prank. The accident resounds in her still, the final notes of the crash, the new background music of her mind. She had been so sure that Pompey had sabotaged number 11. It appeased her sense of order. If Kanker wanted to set her up, any number in her department would have been happy to oblige, but Lila May fixated on Pompey, the Uncle Tom, the grinning nigger, the house nigger who is to blame for her debased place in the world. Pompey gave them a blueprint for color folk, how they acted, how they pleased white folks, how eager they would be for a piece of the dream that they would do anything for Massa. She hated her place in their world where she fell in their order of things and blamed Pompey. Mm. Her shucking shadow in the office. She could not see him any more than anyone else in the office had seen him. Her hatred. Fulton's hatred of himself and his lie of whiteness. White people's reality is built on what things appear to be. That's the business of empiricism. They judge them on how they appear when they hold up to the light, the wear on the carriage buckle, the stress fractures in the motor casing, his skin. Picture this. Fulton, the great reformer, the steady man at the helm of the Department of Elevator Inspectors, gives up his chair when the elevator companies try to buy his favor, place him in their advertisements. They have already bought off many of the street men. 
building owners lay cash on inspectors in exchange for fastidious blindness to defect. Their sacred empiricism has no meaning when it can be bought. When they can't even see that this man is colored because he says he is not, or doesn't even say it. They see his skin and see a white man. Retreat behind the stone walls of the Institute does not change matters. He is still not colored. There is another world beyond this one. He was trying to tell them, and they wouldn't hear it. Don't believe your eyes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the line, um, their empiricism couldn't be trusted because it can be bought, like is such a, I really think is one of the central ideas of this book. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's reductive to turn this into a, like, you know, don't judge a book by its cover kind of book. Um, I think he's, it's a much, much more complex and more interesting idea than that. Um, and it is a really cool idea, this whole sense that there is another world beyond the one that we can see. And that's what the whole metaphor of the book of empiricism and intuition and this black box elevator that's going to transform us into this other vertical culture is the, waiting there for us if only we could not just open our eyes, but sort of open our senses. I think one of the things that maybe I don't love about that particular metaphor is that I, I think it is too simple. You know, that, that you know, in the notion of the intuitionist, you can have, say, Stephen Hawking imagining the existence of black holes even though no one has ever sensed them with a telescope before, or Einstein imagining gravity wells, or all sorts of other experiments like those. But those experiments are only possible because some empiricist came before and measured, you know, the force of gravity and the, the bending of the earth. That we really need both if, mm. if, no, if knowledge and progress. And I think another way in which, you know, the empiricists being easily bought, being wrong, being hypocrites. Is, is, she's, she's indicting them for, for sure as she thinks about it, but she's also indicting herself, you know, and, and recognizing what, that she's doing the same thing she's accusing them of doing in her sort of too readily blaming Pompey for the accident and seeing a boogeyman in him. And it reminds me of, you know, a uh, recent book, um, Ibram X. Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist, uh, which I read a couple years ago. It's a challenging book, and he has a moment where he talks about anti-whiteness as an aspect, as a shadow, as a manifestation of anti-black racism. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the argument, as I understand it, is his, his definition of racism is pretty simple, which is, or a racist idea is pretty simple, which is it's an idea that decreases uh, black equity, um, that diminishes black equity. And an anti-racist idea is an idea that increases black equity. And so this idea for black people or other people of color or even white people maybe sort of self-hating who engage in kind of anti-whiteness and say like oh white people are so annoying you know uh, the the way they behave like on the street that in in kendy's view that is actually serving white supremacy because it implicitly acknowledges the value and existence of racial distinctions Mm -hmm. it implicitly acknowledges the existence of whiteness as something that you can make fun of and therefore blackness might also be something that you can and dismiss and make fun of at least that's how i understand his argument in that moment and i think something similar is going on here too which is the antipathy between lila may who is She's belligerent. She is aggressive. She takes what she wants from the world. You know, she she holds her chin up and her despising Pompey for being obsequious and people pleasing and being a quote unquote Uncle Tom, that conflict serves white supremacy. Right. Mm -hmm. Having, you know, having this the quote unquote house slaves and field slaves in conflict one another 
serves the power structure. And um, Coombs snatches even acknowledges that in that sure. final scene in his like very comfortable corporate office, which is a yeah. symbol of basically like. It's a symbol of, well, it's a symbol, it could be a lot of things. It could be a symbol of him increasing black equity and succeeding, um, but you get a sense that it's not that, that it's probably part of the zero-sum game that pits black people against each other in order to keep, you know, whites in power. Um, he even brings it up. He even says nothing yeah. better than having, you know, than pitting the two black people in the office against each other. He's... he's He's baiting her a little bit, yeah. too, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and and, well, and I think, you know, what I see with him and also with Fulton is you actually get four strategies mm -hmm. of, of black people trying to succeed and survive in a world dominated with white people. You know, mm -hmm. Lila May might be the one that appears to be the most admirable, which is that she is formidable and she is proud and she masters you know, sort of the white science of elevator inspection even better than the white people, right? She beats them at their own game. Then you have James Fulton, who passes. Mm -hmm. And then you have Pompey, who is the, you know, he's obsequious. Mm -hmm. He is the people pleaser. And then, you know, you have the race trader yep. um, in Combs, who is, he makes himself indispensable to white people. Um, and at at times to the detriment of his own people. I mean, I think this is the way a lot of people think about Clarence Thomas or Ben Carson right mm -hmm. now. Maybe it's unfair to them. Um, and, you know, I think that those four are sort of being compared. And, you know, it's sort of interesting. I don't, I, I think as a white person, I, I would not really consider it my place to kind of enter into that conflict, you know, or enter into that debate. But I definitely think Colson Whitehead is laying out those four. They're all four of these characters are foils to one another um, in, in a in a respect. And if you include Natchez as sort of a separate character, in addition to Coombs, you Correct. get another one, yeah. you know. Um, and if you include Mrs. Rogers, you get even yet another one. Um, that you have these different strategies. And I think the un unfortunate reality is that no matter how you succeed, it's going to be brokered through and allowed by white people. Yeah. And, and they all, the sort of tragedy, the reason that the perfect elevator is the joke is, is that reality mm -hmm. is, you know, we're not going to achieve the perfect lift yeah. because, um, the world won't let us achieve the perfect lift. And, you know, perhaps Combs is the most comfortable with that because he's figured out a way to make it work for him. Yeah, so. there's sort of a white physics that keeps the black uh, transcendence pinioned to the world. Um, yeah. Kind of, and, and that's, and, you know, I mean, everything that you've brought up is essentially a case of projections. Yeah. That like every everybody is kind of projecting their assumptions about identity onto the other black people around them. All of the black characters in this book are sort of making decisions about the other black people in the book. Um, one of my favorite characters is Freeport Jackson. Oh, yeah. The beauty product salesman. I was going to ask you why you think that's in there. Like because it, it is does not drive the plot forward. Nope. Yep, it's just it's another flashback. Um, we get and it's to similar to the date, the 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 date. Um, mm -hmm. Only it has a the opposite outcome. It's, for Lila it's consummated. Yeah, I mean, you, you yeah. kind of get some of this book is a coming of age story, right? And and maybe some of the like, why is this here? Might be some of that narrative lack of focus that we're we're kind of talking about. Um, yeah. And yeah, I want to say that, um, yeah, Mr. Whitehead, I love this book. I'm very impressed it, by it. It, um, it, it. it is a brilliantly drawn scene, yeah. too. The, um, but why is that in there? I think that it is important that he is a, a beauty product salesman. Um, yeah. And that he that he sells... Selling hair straighteners and skin and lighteners. And skin lighteners uh, to... to and, and uh, he has a very damning line. Of course, you'll understand my clientele are colored. Yeah. That's that that is, I, I think, an echo of Coombs's 
kind of, okay, in order to make this work, I have to play this kind of terrible game. This yeah. kind of like white facing of my race in order to get acceptance and to be perceived as beautiful. Um, and it's really, uh, it's really, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that that's why that's in there. Um, we do also get to see a kind of more helpless Lila May in this unnamed but great city, uh, which is a question that I, I have for you um, mm. about the nature of the unnaming. Um, yeah. But yeah, why is that? I mean, I really do enjoy that scene. Um, it's a great question about why is it there? How does it actually, it doesn't drive the plot forward, um, but it does serve to continue to create this world. Um, it's certainly lot... characterization for Lila May. Too. Yeah, I mean, you a know, lot of this... We know that she's not entirely an innocent and that she's not above going to bed with somebody who she might even find a little bit contemptible, you know, yeah. just because she wants to have sex. Right. You know, um, you know, you've been working on a screenplay, and in a screenplay, you get very little time to... You get little time for, like, eddies. Yeah. You know, you don't, you don't, you just don't have the real estate, you know, um, the literal that, time. That scene would not be in a screenplay unless it somehow advanced the plot. Unless yeah. he were to somehow, like, help her get the blueprint later or something right. like totally. that. Right, totally. And in a novel, and you also couldn't do this in a short story. Like, yeah. you wouldn't be afforded that kind of thing. I really do think that films and short stories are much more analogous to each other. And that novels and these days TV series are analogous to each other. Totally. Yeah. You can do things like this scene that serve as world building. That, that exists to create um, the world that you're in. Um, there's this wonderful piece of misdirection where they go into the Chesterfield and she's very impressed. And it turns out he's not staying there because he can't afford it. <laughs> and uh, staying at oh, the hotels are named so wonderfully. What is the hotel that they're actually that he's actually in? Oh, it, I, it's sort of something of a flop house. A, yeah, um, totally. You know, um, not maybe not the worst place you could stay, but and interestingly, he did say, I, "I'm staying at the subway stop at a yeah. hotel at the subway stop. The Chesterton or whatever it's called is the hotel at the subway stop." He did not lie, but he did let her believe that uh, he was staying there. But it, yeah, in that that it's it is there's a bit of a deflated moment where he confesses that he's not staying there. And then it's sort of, you're sort of expecting Lila May to be like, okay, whatever, that was fun. I'm going to go home now. That was an, in and she goes into the hotel yeah, with him. I think him she says and, something and, like, of course, you know, she has course. sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, she goes along to get along. I've got a reading from that. This is the section I wanted to read. So I'm just going to jump on Great. that. Um, okay. Yep. The grease in Freeport's hair snatched the lights from the Chesterfield Hotel and glistened like a frog's back. They were just outside the corona of the hotel, the bow of illumination that demarcated the establishment's domain from the craggy pavement of the metropolis without. Lila May said, You were going my way all along. He winked and cocked his fingers into a gun and shot her. Would you like to have a drink? Freeport asked. The hotel bar is something to see, he said, if you've never seen it. The ruby carpet adept at keeping the city's gray encroachments at bay, climbed up the steps to the Chesterfields Hotel's brass entryway, up to the light within. She'd read about the Chesterfield. Most people had. The president stayed here on his very last visit. They kept a suite open for him, the newspaper said. But she didn't know they let colored people stay here. Behind Lila May, that sullen underground gorge, abandoned to the citizens' abuse, cracked and stained. Freeport mm. said, it's the least I can do to repay you for walking me home. I thought you were walking me, Lila May said. Exactly, Freeport said with a smile, his palm open before the carpet. I mean, so I picked that because of that first sentence, the grease in Freeport's hair snatched the lights from the Chesterfield Hotel and glistened like a frog's back. I, I can see it. I can see the light sort of glimmering through his conch, you know. And, and it's interesting because we know that he's a salesman and that he conks his own hair, he straightens his own hair. 
there's something a little bit absurd and a little bit pathetic about him too. Although what's interesting is that his, you know, one has the sense that he might try the same routine on every attractive young woman he meets, you know, and that it might work one out of 50, a hundred times, but like we catch him on his lucky night, you know, and there's, and it, 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 it's a wonderful reversal too. And it, it, it's, I do find him both kind of pitiable, repugnant, and likable. And I think that maybe that's part of what's going on here, too, is that, I, you know, it's really not my place, and nor do I really think it's anybody's places, but it's especially not my place to judge what black people need to do to survive in a world dominated by white people, you oh. know? And if you have to sell, if you have to conk your hair and sell hair straightener and skin lightener, or you have to be a corporate race trader, or you have to pass, or you have to be obsequious and let your boss literally kick you in the butt before giving you a raise and a promotion. It, the, the, the enemy there is not the people putting up with that and enduring it. The enemy is the people making that necessary there, too. So that, I mean, that's part of the theme, but it is also just like, Colson Whitehead is taking us on a playground balance beam between squalid and beautiful yeah. and between admirable and contemptible throughout that moment. And that is lovely. Yeah. Yeah. The seesaw of that admirable and contemptible feeling, the demarcation of the like gray, craggy, you know, kind of ravine of the city and yeah. then this sort of glittering, ruby, um, coronad, uh, well-lighted establishment. I mean, this, this, the reason I picked this is the, the verbs. Um, mm. The grease snatched the lights. The mm. ruby carpet climbed the steps. Mm. He, he deploys transitive verbs in a way that I think a, a bunch of writers do, but there is a certain level of like glee and ardor to Colson Whitehead's diction that I, I found myself thinking of PG Wodehouse. Mm. Um, I found wow. mys- I found myself thinking of uh, of Bertie Wooster because if you read Wodehouse, um, you are exposed to the most wild array of transitive verbs that uh, that Wooster does in order to live his Woostery life. There's hmm. some amazing line where he says something like. I was a bit bored that afternoon, so I oiled on down to the club. Uh, <laughs> and you're yeah. like, not a verb about locomotion. But and, it works. And it, it, it works, works perfectly. And yeah. I really think that other, you know, if we, we can set aside some of our quibbles about the unfocused nature of this book, yeah. um, as a piece of sentences being put together, it's bananas good i mean it's it's very i mean like i would I, it would be really interesting to read his works and michael chabon's work sort of one yeah. after another yeah. um because i think the mysteries of pittsburgh which is kind of a noir book as well and also has the same sort of lyrical flights that this book has and suffers through some of the problems of a debut novel of like lack of focus and being actually able to land the plane um, but yeah, I really do think that those writers have a similar project of kind of like yearning towards transcendence through language. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah. And I just, I, I mean, I, that, that the snatching the, his, the grease in his hair, snatching the light from the hotel. It's so good. I mean, I, I found myself so many times in this book of being like, Fuck. That is such an amazing and weird piece of figurative language, um, but it so works. Yeah. I mean, it just, I don't know, it, it, it illustrates how important verbs are. And also the noun or the direct object in that sentence, that it's the grease taking the action, too. Yeah. You know, I mean, many writers would just say his hair shone, the light shone in his hair. You know, that's how they would say it. The light would be the direct object. Um, you know, or they would try to find a way to make him, you know, he glowed in, you know, in the light or something like that. And the idea that it's the grease doing the thing, which it kind of is, 
you know i mean and, and but in, and it's drawing your attention to that particular detail um yeah it, it is absolutely lovely his sentences are i agree like in terms of contemporary writers, the only one I can think of who comes close is Shabon. Mm-hmm. You know, I do think like among the people we've read, Jennifer Egan and Neil Stevenson both have uh, wonderful sentence flourishes as well. But there's there is there is a delight and there is a, at the same time a precision. Yeah. To the point where you know, sometimes it's sort of like I'm enjoying the sentences more than I'm enjoying the story at this moment, too. I think we should go to trivia. I, I think, think we so had a too. good discussion. Who's um, the host today? I believe I'm the host okay. today. I think you were the host <laughs> last time. Um, I mean, it's a little bit vague at this point, but I think I'm the host. So um, I got interested uh, as we were finishing the book. I was intrigued by whether uh, James Fulton was an analog for like a real college president or something like that or okay. a real. And, and I did some poking around and I couldn't. In the time I had, I could not find anybody sort of any analog for a kind of intellectual powerhouse, a president of a university, somebody like that who, you know, was uh, black but passing as white or mistaken for white. Um, But I did find in the early, maybe the sort of second age of Hollywood, like 1930s through 1950s, uh, a handful of people... um, who were actors who were thought to be white, um, who either, who did not correct the record. Um, They may not have actively lied about their heritage or background, um, but in fact had um, uh, black parents or grandparents, in some cases actually also uh, Latino or Latinx as well. But um, I I am going, I'm thinking of one person, so I'm going to give you a quiz so what Hollywood actor passed as white for much of their career, despite having a, a very, I'll just say uh, one of their grandparents was black. Okay. Is it A, Carol Channing, B, Clark Gable, or C, Vincent Price? And if you need me to give you a sentence of each of those person's career, I can, I can also give you, if you're not familiar with all three. No, I got that. Um... Carol Channing, Clark Gable. Clark Gable? Clark Gable. It is Carol Channing, ah! the, the actress and Broadway singer who, um, in her 80s or something, published a memoir uh, revealing that her, her grandmother was black. And I, to say it was passing might be a bit too strong. I don't know that she told lies about it, I just th- I, but I also think she... She was assumed to be white, and she allowed that assumption to continue without overtly correcting the record. And I suspect in her early career, you know, in the 30s and 40s, that would have been a real problem for her, you know. Um, Although she continued performing into her 80s. I remember her coming to Charlottesville, I think when I was in college or, you know, in the early 2000s or something like that. Uh, And uh, so she had a very, very long career. Okay. Um, I um, continued to be obsessed with elevators. Um, ah. I have a very simple one here. Um, okay. This is about the tallest elevator in the world. Oh. So I'm okay. going to give you three options and the country uh, of origin uh, where this particular eleva- uh, elevator is. And okay. uh, your job is to pick the, uh, the tallest one. The biggest distance traveled. Right. Is it A, uh, Shanghai Tower in China... B, the Anglo Gold Ashanti Zimponeg Gold Mine in South Africa. Or C, the Burj Khalifa in Abu Dhabi, uh, a building I believe immortalized in Mission Impossible. Infamy? Infamy. Well, my recollection that with both the Burj Khalifa and the Jeddah Tower is that they actually have multiple elevator shafts. Mm. Um, so there isn't one elevator that goes all the way to the top because um, that building is about a half a mile tall. Um, I actually interviewed one of the architects who worked on it a few years ago. Um, that was pretty fun. He was really into flying cars. I can't remember. Uh, Gordon Gill. Um, that was a fun interview. Very, very, very uh He's one of those people who's like, why can't we have flying cars? Um, I, I don't know how the Shanghai Tower is very, very tall. It's not as tall as the Burj. So you would expect there to be a bigger elevator in the Burj 
although maybe in the Shanghai Tower is more of a monolithic structure, as I recall, so it's possible it goes all the way up. But you know what? I think it's the gold mine because gold mines go deep. Um, so I'm going to just guess the gold mine in South Africa. You are correct. <laughs> Woohoo! As a bonus, uh, I want you to guess how many multiples uh, the gold mine is bigger than the Shanghai Tower, which is the second tallest, uh, the second lo- longest elevator in the world. Um, oh, okay. Uh, yes, the Burj Khalifa is only the fourth longest elevator. Because in the world. because they because it's an incredibly tall building, but I do think that like the they have multiple like the elevators go up to like the hundredth floor, and then you got to get off and take another elevator up another sixty floors or something. That's like absurd. That. <laughs> um, Why would you do that? Well, it has to do with it. Yeah, I mean. I don't know, but you, I have to do that at, at office buildings all the time. You have to go to the lobby level. Um, yeah, uh, okay, how many, th- how many orders, uh, how many times? Not how many times, how many multiples? But multiples, yeah. okay. Um, and well, I'll, I'll tell you the Shanghai Tower is 578 and a half meters. Uh, uh, the, the, the elevator in the Shanghai Tower is 578 meters uh, bottom yeah. to top. Yeah, which is also, I don't think, the, quite the entire building, too. I think it's a bit taller than that, although it could, it's probably close. Uh, um, yes, the tower has 127 floors, and the lift covers 127 of them. Uh, so it's close, but it is not all the way. So I think in feet, so that's about 1,500 feet. Um, I think for some reason I have in my head that the really deep mining shafts with a really big elevator go about um, 6,000 or 8,000 feet down, which is a long way. I'm gonna, uh, so let's say if it's 6,000, that would be roughly, uh, let me do my math, one and a half is three. Uh, it would be roughly four times the length yeah yeah you got the bonus one too the uh the gold mine is uh just under 2300 meters into mm. the earth about 8,000 feet or a little yeah. yeah yeah okay i'm proud of my estimating right yeah. there i did some good estimating uh it co- the lift covers that distance in under three minutes that's very fast yes that is very fast <laughs> that i'd is... like to see that's that's ear poppingly fast yeah i think it i think it works out to almost 40 miles an hour yeah. Which is um, terrifying. <laughs> you know, like one of the jokes I always made when I used to work at WBEZ in Navy Pier, we had a we had what I called the slowest elevator in Chicago. And it took roughly the same amount of time to get from floor one to floor three where the office was as it takes to get from floor one to floor 96 in the John Hancock Tower where there's a <laughs> lovely cocktail lounge. The, the times were roughly the same. Oh, good God. Yes, yeah. I've, I've been in elevators like that before. One um, of which was very slow and one of which was very fast. One great feature of elevators in Israel on Shabbat, uh, you, uh. you can't touch, you can't operate any machinery on Shabbat. Yeah. So the elevators on Shabbat simply just run constantly opening doors on every level which makes makes using the elevator on shabbat like so frustrating and tedious um but i don't know why you couldn't just like hire a goy bellhop you know on on shabbat (laughs) no um well that's part of it you can't you can't benefit there's all uh, sorts of weird things there's a bunch of workarounds like scooters get used but there are tools devised so you're not the person pressing the button on the scooter All sorts of religious, like, workarounds that are just hilarious. But uh, that's probably trivia for another day. It was a good one. Um, yeah. Chris Bagg, will you read Colson Whitehead's The Intuitionist another time? I don't think so. I, you know, like, it's rare for me to say no, uh, even though I think I said that about Zodiac. Um, I will mine this book for its language. I will definitely keep it nearby as like uh, I need I need I need to like immerse myself in like you know something super lyrical. Um, I I think it I think it's sort of lost enough focus towards the end. Well, I had a question here that we didn't really get to that is fine. Mm-hmm. I think there is I think the problem of this book and of Zodiac and of some of the other Stevenson we talked about is too much setup and not enough dominoes falling. Yeah. And uh, and and I think this particular one, both you and I were sort of confused by some of the dominoes falling, especially towards the end. And it was a little hard to figure out exactly what was happening. I'm glad I'm really glad I read it, but I don't I think I think instead I will go and read all the rest of Colson Whitehead. 
Yeah, I would, yeah, I would say I think Lila May gets out of Jeopardy a little bit too easily. Like that, like they, again, to me, it's just the weight of the metaphor becomes stronger than the plot. And the real masterful thing to do with Noir is when the plot and the allegory are are equals, are serving each other equally. And I think it starts that way, but then over time, just it's sort of like the ending is massaged. To fit the allegory yep. as opposed to the ending and the allegory have a kind of organic yeah i think i agree i don't think i'll read it again um maybe i would as a kind of like study in author progression mm-hmm. um i i do think that is an interesting thing to do um but i completely agree with you that i really really now i've read his first novel and i've read his most recent novel Harlem Shuffle. I really enjoyed Harlem Shuffle. I would also say it's a little bit less ambitious. Mm. Um, whereas my understanding is both the Nickel Boys and the Underground Railroad are very ambitious and excellent. And I definitely want to read them and probably soon. Um, so next up, I think the next thing that you will hear from us listeners is our draft day for yeah. our next uh, series of books that will take us for perhaps another trip around the sun. Yeah, well, of course, thanks for listening. Um, we could always use more uh, reviews. They they really help. Uh, Good Pods or Apple Podcasts slash iTunes are kind of the best place to do that, although you can try doing it in whatever app. I believe you can do reviews in Spotify. Um, so uh, we got a review. It was actually a while ago. Uh, we were, we've been a bit um, tardy, uh, but we did get a review from Leah Jones of Finding Favorites, which I'm going to read right now. It was a five-star review, and we said we would read the first 10 five-star reviews that we've gotten. Also, as an aside, I was listening to Finding Favorites the other day, and Leah had a little aside where she mentioned that she read a review I did of her show, but I accidentally tricked tricked her into thinking that the review came from chat gpt uh because if you recall i i disguised myself as chat gpt when i self-reviewed our podcast because i didn't want to i wanted that to be a joke the title of this review is book club without shame five stars by chicago leah i learned about upper middle brow on twitter through mutuals with the hosts jesse and chris I'd gone through a Neil Stevenson phase, and they kicked off the podcast with him, so I started listening. While I rarely read or reread the books in time for the podcast, Jesse and Chris have created a fun book club without the shame of showing up when you didn't read the book. Upper Middle Brow has a fun grad school hangout vibe. The hosts are incredibly smart and well-read, and there's inside jokes and good vibes, too. So thank you for that review, Leah, and totally... We love it if you want to read along, but also if you just want to read, listen to this podcast as a kind of critical review of books you might read one day, I think it probably works that way. There will be spoilers, but um, you're certainly welcome to do that. And you also, if you read the book 17 years ago and you don't expect you're going to do it, you're certainly also welcome to listen to Upper, upper Middle Brow. We're, we're happy to have you. And everybody go listen to Finding Favorite is a blast. Upper Middle Brow is a small point production. Chris Bagg and Jesse Dukes are the warring pragmatists and transcendentalists. Music is by Ben Pajak and Jesse Dukes. Design and website by me, Chris Bagg. And you can learn more about us at uppermiddlebrow.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. It's interesting because we are both rather empiricist when it comes to reading, although certainly we're intuitionists too. I would, I don't think we could be pigeonholed as one or the other, and I certainly don't think one of us is more empiricist or more intuitionist than the other. I don't think so. I think we, we veer back and forth uh, pleasantly. <laughs>